of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we see two things here. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And these two things are not the same. The knowledge of God pertains to the character of God, the nature of God. When you know God, you reflect his character. When you know him, the result is that that knowledge bears fruit. And so you become like him. So when the earth is filled with the knowledge of God, the result is that we'll have peace on this earth. So when you look at that scripture in Isaiah 11 verse 9, you're talking about the government of Jesus, that thousand year reign of Jesus. And he said that at that time, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God so that there will be perfect peace. There will be no hatred or bitterness even among the animals in the animal kingdom. He said the lion, uh, the, the wolf, and the sheep, they will dwell together and they will both eat grass. It says that a child can play with a cobra and it will not hurt him. They said there shall be no hurt on my holy mountain. Why? Because that, that dispensation will be filled with the knowledge of God. Now, the knowledge of the glory of God is about his splendor, his power, his charisma, his outward visible show of greatness. Hello? So, the knowledge of God is about character. The knowledge of the glory of God is about charisma. It is something that we see. The knowledge of God works in us. Okay? Works in us. You see, when you come to know God, that knowledge works in you. That's why the devil's fairy that. Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, okay, um, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That knowledge of God is in you. It's in you. It's in your spirit. It's in your soul. And that is what the devil fights against. So the knowledge of God is in us. Is in us. That's why the devil fights, fights against it through his weapons, thoughts, imaginations, arguments, you know, and, and, and all that high things that fight, that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. But the knowledge of the glory of God works from outside. It is an impact that God makes and imprints his greatness on our minds. So when the knowledge of the glory of God fills a place, people will have an indelible impression about God. There's something about God's splendor, his power, uh, about God's greatness that will be imprinted, ingrained on the minds of people. Hello? I said hello. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, for instance, God appeared to the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 to 21, and then we'll see how God, why God appeared to them. Um, the, the reason God appeared to them was to change them from outside to inside. And so he had to use the glory of God. Because that one works from outside to inside. The knowledge of God, knowledge of God works from inside. You, you know him in your spirit. Be still and know that I am God. So you know him in your spirit and that works something on the inside. From inside to outside. But the knowledge of his glory is from outside to inside. You get, you get a fear of God by what you see, what you feel, what you encounter. Now all the people witness the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. God had come to visit them. Uh, he, he told Moses to bring them to himself on the mountain. And Moses brought them to the mountain. And God was coming to tell them, hello. And when God came to say hello, the people fled. Then they said to Moses, verse 19, You speak with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear might be, may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. 
In fact, you have to go to Hebrews to even know that even Moses said, I trembled exceedingly. I quaked and I trembled exceedingly. So it's not easy to abide the glory of God. When God manifests in his glory, you know, to your flesh, it's not easy. Okay? But he wanted to imprint his fear in their minds so that they will have his fear in their minds so that they will, they, will, they, will, they will not sin against him. So he came from outside to inside. Because at that time he could not start from inside to outside. Because we know their spirits were not born again. Okay? But then, even this one, it did not secure a permanent, lasting change. Because these people still rebelled against God. Despite all the things they saw. It's like the people that were in, uh, uh, around in Jesus' time. Despite all the miracles they saw, all the mighty things they saw, it could not change them. Their hearts were hardened because their hearts were not born again. Their spirits were not open. So all that Jesus did, he preached the gospel of the kingdom in signs and wonders, you know, so that the people at least see all those things and open up their hearts to the Lord. But the work had not been done. The work was done on Calvary's cross, where now the, the, the way into the Holy of Holies was, was, was open. And people could receive the knowledge of God. Okay, so God wanted to get their attention with his glory, so that he will infuse them with his character. And that's what God does all the time. That's, the, that's why we preach the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is preached with signs and wonders. Why? It is to get the attention of people. Somebody said, miracles, signs and wonders, they are the dinner bells of the gospel. They are the dinner bells. You know, so like when you hear the sound of the bell, then you know that food is ready. You come. They attract you. So the gospel of the kingdom is preached with power. Miracles, signs, wonders. Why? Because that is administering the knowledge of the glory of God. That's supposed to attract people. Attract people. But the knowledge of God relates to our calling as the salt of the earth. And then the knowledge of the glory of the Lord relates to our calling as the light of the earth. So we, are, we have these two callings. Salt of the earth, light of the world. If it's, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, uh, verse 12, uh, verse, uh, 12 and uh, 14. Let go, go to verse 14. Matthew 5, 14. Okay, no, 13 first, 13. You see, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Go to 15, 16. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Okay? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So light shines and it releases glory. Salt changes and influences. I'll, I'll get to that. So these two, these two things, salt of the earth and light of the world, they represent two faces of our calling. Two faces of our calling as king priest. Light, salt of the earth, light of the world. If you study the Bible very well, you will see that the Bible, um, even though it talks about many things, but you will see the main theme that runs through scripture is kingdom. And by kingdom, what I mean is that um, both kingdoms, there are two main kingdoms. I hope you know that. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And both kingdoms, their supreme desire is to colonize the earth. Colonize the earth. Dominate. Have dominion. The earth is a very interesting part of God's creation. The earth. The earth is said that it's so important that it's like the stage. The stage. It's like going to an auditorium, the stage where all the performances take place. As a matter of fact, anything that takes place in eternity 
must be ratified on earth. Otherwise, it's null and void. Whatever God does in eternity, it must find expression on earth. Do you know the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world? And yet, nobody could get born again. So he came on earth here to express that, to be slain literally on this earth. So this earth holds a very important place in the scheme of things for both the divine and the demonic. That's why these two kingdoms, they have always looked onto the earth as a place of expression. And they have an obsession to dominate. The earth is neutral, but there's always a world that should govern the earth at every point in time. The earth is neutral, but the world that govern or rules over the earth that world there's a spiritual world that must govern the earth at every point in time what adam did for instance was not to uh, create darkness darkness was there before adam came what adam did was to vote darkness as the default kingdom or government that spiritual government that rules over the earth that's what adam did what Christ came to do was to establish another kingdom, light, to, this, to, to overthrow that kingdom of darkness in reality. But in manifestation, it will come after this era is over. So these two kingdoms have always been engaged in a battle for the earth, a battle for the earth. That's why... Um, when Jesus Christ came, one of the things that he couldn't keep quiet about was the fact that he had finished God's work on this earth. In, in John 17 verse 4, he said, I have glorified you on the earth. John 17 4, I have glorified you on the earth. Why? I have finished the work you asked me to do. John 17 4, you asked me to do. So, just as it is God's desire that the earth is filled with the knowledge of God, okay, uh, as the waters cover the sea, so is it, is it also the desire of the kingdom of darkness that darkness will also cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So, the two are really doing their best. John 17, 4. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. He was, he was emphatic. I've glorified you on the earth. It's like, I've registered my presence. I've done something on earth too. Because Lucifer's rebellion started on the earth. You have said in your heart, I will ascend. So he was on the earth, I will ascend. So he rebelled against God on the earth. And Jesus Christ came and submitted to the will of God also on the earth. I've glorified you on the earth. So the earth is very important. And you know, when we say the earth, don't be thinking about anything. Your body is part of the earth. Uh, your space, geographical space, is part of the earth. The things you control, they are all part of the earth. There are many things that are part of dust. This microphone is part of dust. Um, these speakers, everything here, a time will come when we leave them down here. By the time we come back, after many, many years, they will be converted to dust. So everything you see around is the earth. So when we say glorify God in the earth, start from your body. Your, your body is a piece of earth, a piece, a, an earth suit that is housing your spirit. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth, including your body. Your body too is part of the earth. Now, so, you will see, come to Isaiah 60 verse 1 to 2. You will see that these two kingdoms see arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the lord is written upon you anytime you see glory it talks about light glory light so the knowledge of the glory of god is about our function as light okay Be for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people who is pushing the darkness to cover the earth is the kingdom of darkness led by the devil but the Lord, he said, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Go to verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light 
and kings to the brightness of your rising. So now, what, what are they doing? Now you see a battle right here. Darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness. The people, who, who did that? The devil. But the devil wants our hearts to be darkened through ignorance. But the Lord said, now you arise. Shine. Why? Your light has come. Even a matchstick or a candle can make a difference in darkness. Because you can see it. That's why I said God's problem is not the darkness. It's about the light. When we function as light, okay, when we function as light, so these two kingdoms, they both seek to extend their influence. Last week I told you that God's, uh, uh, God had a, uh, an aim to extend his influence. And we saw that the picture he gave was the, the river that went from Eden to water the garden, and then from the garden they parted into four river heads, four major river heads saying that God wanted his influence to reach to the ends of the earth, not just to be confined to the Garden of Eden, but to go beyond the Garden of Eden. And that was Adam's assignment. But then he voted another kingdom into, into government, the kingdom of darkness. And so darkness kept on spreading and spreading till man was totally engulfed with that darkness. So our hearts were made dark. Our hearts were darkened. The knowledge of God did not live in man anymore. Man didn't know God. There was no light. So God began to uh, come and look for man and give man light and all that. So, Jesus unveiled this strategy of God, salt and light. When he was given a profile of kingdom people, you know, from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, it's, 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 it's a discourse on the kingdom, the systems of the kingdom. I think I've, I've, I've talked about that in one of the schools, uh, one of the ministers' retreat, um, um, uh, things pertaining to the kingdom. One of the topics I, I talked about developing the kingdom mindset. And then I talked about the profile of the kingdom people and the kind of thing Jesus used to describe the kingdom people. And I, I talked about kingdom concepts, many things on the kingdom. I, I talked about them in, in that series. But Jesus. Jesus talked about the kingdom people, our profile. And then he said, you are the salt of the earth. Then he said, you are the light of the world. The salt of the earth. Light of the world. Salt of the earth. Light of the, of the, of the, of the, of the world. So the salt came first. Then the light came afterwards. So salt is our basic identity. And that corresponds to the life we have in us. Then light is the product of that life that we have in us. You see, light comes out of life. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. So God's formula is for you to get life. When you get life, then the life expresses or produces light. That life is for your sustenance. But that light is for people, people to know and give God glory. So he said, let your light shine before men. Where is that light coming from? That light is coming from the light that is in you. The life in you, you being the salt, you will produce light. So you will be the salt of the earth, and then from you, light will proceed. And people will see your light and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That is what God is saying. Okay. So, when our identity as salt is established, we will shine forth as light. That's what I want to say. As an individual Christian, when your identity as salt is established, you will shine forth. You cannot just be a believer going to heaven. No, people must see your good works and they must give glory to God. So you, you have life, all right, but that's not enough. It must result into light. It must shine. Let men, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father. So the father doesn't get glory until your light shines. You see, the father doesn't get glory until your light shines. So God doesn't get glory on Sundays when we come and lift up our hands and we worship him. That's not we glorify your name. We are not giving God glory. Hello? He gets glory when we go out there and our light is shining. God doesn't get glory by just you know, receiving life. Because the life came from him. God is not impressed with seeds. 
Because he is the one who supplies seeds to the sower. By his impress with fruit. Let, he said that, let your fruit, when you bear fruit, here is my father glorified that you will bear much fruit, that your fruit may abide. John 15, 8. That if you bear much fruit, your fruit will abide. He said that's where your father is glorified. In the same way, he said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and then they may glorify the Lord. That's where God gets glory. So you steal God's glory when you refuse to shine as a believer. And sometimes we don't major on the salt and so our light only blind people instead of shining before them. Let your light shine before men. That's not mean let your light blind them. Because sometimes we blind them with our light because we don't major on our identity as salt. You see, when you develop yourself as a believer and you major on your identity as salt, people, when people see your light, they come to you. When they taste you, then they know who you really are. So the light is to attract people. That's why even our charisma can attract people. Your beauty can attract somebody. Your giftings can attract somebody. That's why the gifts of the Spirit, they are compared to bells. They make noise. They attract. But it is your character that will, that will satisfy people. Fruit that will satisfy them. People are not satisfied by leaves. They are satisfied by fruit. So we can make noise as believers. Shine forth. Make noise. Uh, our leaves will be shaking. It will attract people. Then they will come close looking for fruit. No fruit. Just noise. That's why Paul said, if I speak in tongues and I have no love, I'm like a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. Because I'm just speaking in tongues. Attracting people. Okay? So now, our spirituality, if it is just in things that people see and doesn't spring from our heart, is futile. So people will see us displaying gospel paraphernalia, displaying Jesus loves you stickers, displaying um, hell is real stickers, or singing gospel songs, or wearing a branded t-shirt and all that. That is good. You are advertising Christ, promoting the light of the gospel. But it should be sustained by your conduct as a believer, your identity as salt. That is what will make people, your light shine before people. Otherwise, your light will blind them. There are some people, you see them carrying baby Bibles. See them, all the Christian jargons. They know Christianese. I hope you know Christianese. Do you know Christianese? But do you know Chinese? And Japanese? I don't know Christianese. Christianese is a Christian language we speak in church. Hallelujah. Bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praising. Yeah, praising. God is good. And all the time, let the weak say, let the poor say, that is Christianese. Those things, they are good, but they mean nothing. If your heart is not right with God, they are just cliches. They don't change. Lasting change can only spring from inside, from the heart. And sometimes even people that we are with in our workplaces, in our homes and all that, they are not impressed with our Christianity. So when they see you pick your Bible and singing, Hallelujah, uh, they, are, they are not impressed. You can't preach the gospel to them. Why? Your light, you are blinding them with your light because, because your character is so loud. They can't hear what you are saying. Your bad attitude is so loud, they can't hear the good news you are, you are preaching. That's why one of the qualifications of a bishop or an overseer is that he must have a reputation even among those who are unbelievers. In, 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 in first, first Timothy um, 3, I think verse 7 or 8, it says the one, if you are choosing an overseer or a leader in the church, it says moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside lest he fall into reproach and the stuff of the devil. So, to know your spirituality, I have to come to your house. I don't, not, not church. How, I can't know you. <laughs> your, your, no, 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 church will not let you know how spiritual you are. No. When we come to church, we all put on our best. Is that not so? Yeah, I don't dress like this in the house. 
If you come to my house, you see that I don't wear these things in my house. So then you see the real me. I'm talking figuratively. Yeah, so if, you, if we come to your workplace, would they, would they testify of you as salt, as real light? Or your light is blinding them? Your light is blinding them. They, they, keep, they keep hearing that, oh, I, this man of God said this. Daddy Joe said this. You are playing even my teachings in your, in your office, at home, but your attitude is telling the people that well, all that I'm, I'm listening to uh, you know, is, is, is fake. I, I, don't, I don't leave it. So the person will say, that, why, should you, why should I also leave it? Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah, so we should focus on our identity as salt. Make sure our character, our Christian character, make sure we are growing in the Lord. Don't, don't measure your spirituality by your activities, by the things you do in church. There are people who say, oh, uh, this, this sister or brother is so spiritual. Let me go and marry the person. They say, why, why this person? Ah, the way he's so spiritual. When he leaves the microphone, heaven will come down. When she sings, my God, this is a ministry material. <laughs> Young people who are in ministry, who want ministry material. Listen, ministry material is not in singing and preaching. It's in character. It's in character. He said, it's not even in beauty. He says, beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Always choose character before beauty. Anytime. Choose the fear of God before riches. Anytime. Choose a good name over riches. Anytime. You will do well in life. Ah, you don't like it. <laughs> ah, okay. But that's, that's true. That's true. You see, God is very protective of his name. That's why when you are coming to maturity, God will be doing like this. I'm protesting my name. Don't, don't, don't come and defile my name. His name is very important to him. So he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me um, to green pastures, right? He leads me beside the still waters. Uh, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. His name's sake. When it comes to his name, he, he, he has demands. So the more you grow in the Lord, the more the Lord will draw your, your, your attention to the fact that my name is important to me. So do not do things that will let people blaspheme my name. So there are certain things that you, you may do that God will be angry because of you giving the enemies an occasion to blaspheme against his name. Paul said, because of you, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of the Lord always. It should not happen. It should not be like the people who you are with in your home, in your, in your community, at your workplace, they, they, they reject Christianity because of your character. Now, if this person is a, a, a believer, then I'm not going to church. If this person goes to this church, ah, I'm not coming. It's a very bad thing. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, David told, uh, God told David, he said, because you have given the enemies of God an occasion to blaspheme, it says, the child who is who, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. God was not, you see, the thing was that what David had done, because of his position, it was going to solve the name of God. And God said, I'm going to punish you. I've forgiven you, but I'll punish you. Why? Because you have sold, you have, you have dragged my name into disrepute. Hello? So it's very important. So both salt and light are agents of influence, but they work differently. In fact, um, when I was writing For Better, For Best, I said, men are from a city called Light City. Women are from Salt City. How many of you read that? Men are from Light City. Women are from Salt City. I was trying to let us know that men and women are very different. The difference is almost like day and night. 
and you can never change the difference. It's of God. It's natural. And I say that light shines. Light provides solution. Salt influences. What God gave women is influence. A woman can influence you to do what she wants you to do without directing you. It's something God gave them. That's why Delilah could <laughs> elicit that information from Samson. Look at the way she approached it. So many tactics. Those tactics, they are natural. Every woman has it. But it's not supposed to be for evil like Delilah's own. It's supposed to be for good. Are you getting me? Yes. Men are solution-oriented, light. So when a man sees love as providing solution to you as a woman, I've provided this for you, I've given you shelter, given you mobility, I've given you this, that, that, so can't you see I love you? But the salt also likes bonding. Okay? So when you go to Salt City, they like bonding. They like, I mean, relationship, spending time, having time for me, listening to me, um, allowing the things that worry me, worry you, crying with me sometimes, empathizing, sympathizing, understanding me, giving me a listening ear. <laughs> so you see, a, a, a man can say, but I've done ABC for you. You are the reason why I'm going up and down. The woman will say, that up and down you are going, do we eat? <laughs> that up and down you... <laughs> hey. So you see, salt and light, even God, God, God's solution for the believer is that we must become the, the both salt and light. Otherwise, if, if uh, you can never understand the woman you can never understand a man. So you will see, when it happens like that, you will see the first divorce that happened, the first divorce that happened, uh, the lightings, they started gathering together. And the saltings started gathering together. And the lightnings were saying, ah, these, these, these guys are too difficult, too demanding. Look at them. Then the saltings are saying, these guys are too insensitive. They think they are doing big, big, big things. It's a small, small thing. <laughs> Somebody, some, as somebody said, made a, a video to a fiancé and said, eh, because I said women like small sports, you are sending me four, four CDs. <laughs> said, but you said women like the small, small things, not the big, big things, you know, small things like compliments, you know, complimenting their nice looks and all that. There are small, small things to us. For men, it's not like, I mean, it's like a waste of time. Why should I celebrate your birthday, tell you you are beautiful? Can't you look at the mirror? Don't you see? Why, 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 why should I compliment your nice, your nice dress and all that? We need to work. We need to make money. The time is money. <laughs> hmm. Now, why, why did Jesus use salt as a metaphor? We need to investigate that metaphor, salt. Why did he use salt as a metaphor for the believer? Because in, in Bible times, salt was very powerful. Now, in our time, salt is only powerful in the kitchen. But in Bible times, in the early days, salt was so powerful. It was, it was, there were no refrigerators, so it was the main thing that was used to preserve meat and food from decay. Salt. So salt is a very strong preservative. Even now, 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 salt can preserve. Then also, when you eat food without salt, you appreciate what Jesus said. That if a salt loses its flavor, what can be used to season it? He said when you are salt and you lose your flavor, you don't become tasteless. He said you become worthless. He said, because, because, he said you are good for nothing. He said it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under feet. But I thought maybe if the salt has lost its flavor, or flavor, maybe it can be used for something else. But he said, no. The only reason why the salt was made was to be used for flavor. 
So if there's no flavor in the salt, then it's good for nothing. He said, so that men should trample upon it. I'm trying to bring your mind to something. Why did Jesus use the metaphor of salt? Salt was not a big deal that it was also used as salary. In fact, I did a research. I typed the word, the phrase, worth his salt. Have you had that phrase before? He said, oh, any, let's say, any pastor worth their salt will never do this. Or any teacher worth his salt. His salt. S-A-L-T. It's, a, it's, a, it's an idiomatic expression. Do you know what brought that expression? What brought that expression was that it was a precious commodity, you know, and it was the Roman soldiers at the point were paid in salt. They were paid in salt. Yes. <laughs> let, me read, let me read what I got from Google. The phrase, worth your salt, originated during Roman times when soldiers were sometimes paid for salt. Salt was an important preservative and valued commodity. So receiving it as pay was an important way to earn a living. Sal is a Latin word for salt. The English word salary is derived from the Latin word salarium. Salt. Yes. Soldiers who demonstrated courage and skill in battle proved themselves worthy of the assault ration. Over time, this evolved to, into a more general phrase, meaning someone who is loyal, dependent, and merits the compensation they are giving. That's why the phrase came, if you are worth your salt. So salt was a very important, very powerful commodity at that time. When Jesus Christ said it, they understood that, oh, then it means that you are the elite. You are the elite of the world. You are the hope of the earth. You are the game changers of the earth. It's like you bring life to the earth. You bring peace where there's no peace. It's like when we are all sorrowful, you come as joy. You are the important ones on this earth. Without you, this earth will go into decay and corruption. So that you, the church believers, without believers, the earth is totally going to corrupt and decay. That's why you say we are the salt of the earth. So wherever we find ourselves, if we know our identity as salt and we are playing it well, you will see that when we enter places, we put things right. We change things. We change the flavor. We change the conversation. We change the focus. We change the direction. We bring light to people. We, we bring hope to people. We bring life to people. We bring love to people. When we cease being that, we become good for nothing. So any believer who is not affecting people, who is not an agent of change, the Bible says is good for nothing. You become a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt cannot make any impact. How do you get a pillar of salt? When you turn to Sodom. When you turn to Sodom, remember Lord's wife, you become a pillar of salt. And a pillar of salt, you cannot make any impact. You, that's good for nothing. Pillar of salt. You are a pillar, but you are, you are salt, but you are a pillar. Meanwhile, salt must dissolve into the food to effect a change. I'm going to tell you why God sent you to that school. Why your natural service, they posted you to that village. Yes. I'm going to tell you, tell you why you find yourself in that family. Why you find yourself in that community. Why you find yourself in that space you control. So that you don't just become a believer who is different. You become a witness. Not just a different person. Oh, I'm not doing what they are doing. They are doing bad things. They are doing good things. That's good. But that's not enough. What, what are you also doing to push the good? Are you getting me? Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, which meant that Lot was a very prominent man. Remember, elders at the gate of Zion. Elders always sit at the gate. So Lot was sitting at the gate like Boaz. Okay? But Lot was not a witness. He was not a voice. He didn't use his position well. He was just different. Not like them. His soul was vexed by their evil deeds. And yet, he couldn't change anybody. 
His influence was just limited to his home. Even his children, Lord's influence could not change them. Because the seed of stone was in them. And it manifested when they went to the mountain. Are you getting it? So Jesus compared us to salt because of flavor. Flavor. And our presence in society should preserve the moral fiber of society. So wherever you get opportunity as a believer, shine the light. Spread the salt. But be salt first before light. Let your conduct preach the gospel first before your mouth. St. Francis of Assisi said, By all means, preach the gospel. And when it became necessary, use words. By all means, preach the gospel. But when it became necessary, use words. Which means that the gospel must be preached primarily with conduct. There are people who are with you in your homes, in your schools. You may not even open your mouth to say a word. They will observe your life and like you. They will look at how peaceful you are, how humble you are, how gentle you are, how kind you are, and they will want to be like you, some way, somehow. By the time you open your mouth to preach the gospel, your lifestyle has gone ahead of you to preach to them. That is why the Bible says we are living epistles, written not with ink, living epistles. So people who don't have access to the Bible should look at our lives and they should read us. And if they follow us, they will follow us to know the Lord because we are established in our identity as salt. Salt is not neutral. Hello? Salt is not neutral. Salt is very, very, very potent. It's not passive. It's very active. When you put salt in soup, Salt, salt will not just say, well, uh, well, let me just stay my way. Once salt is in soup, you will feel it. You will begin to feel the salt. Taste it. If there's no salt in food, how do you feel? So, come to 1 Peter 3, 2. Preach the gospel. And if it be necessary, use words. Preach the gospel. And if it be necessary, use words. Go to verse 1. Preach the gospel, if it becomes necessary, use words. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Verse 2. While when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. It says, that even if they are unbelievers, they without a word, without you speaking, will be won by conduct. Which means that God's first missionary is our lifestyle before the gospel. The gospel first is preached by our life. Then our words follow. This is very important. Now come to Titus 2.10. Titus chapter 2 verse 10. Not pilfering. So, okay, go to verse 9 so that we get it in context. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleased in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Go back, go back, in all things. That they may adorn. Adorn means to dress, decorate. So the gospel you are going to preach should be adorned by your good conduct so you cannot use one side of your mouth to be cursing and insulting another side to be preaching the gospel the same people that you say i'm going to preach to you 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 don't you don't show them love that's why you see sometimes we can go to a place and say okay we are going to sink a borehole we are going to do all those things those things are not necessarily the gospel but it is to um, minister to the people so that we can, we can re push the gospel through. If you go and sing boreholes and all that, you have not preached the gospel. But it's, it's a step to preaching the gospel. But the gospel must be preached first with works. Works before words. Your lifestyle. Another scripture. Philippians 
127. Philippians 127. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's how you become a salt. Your conduct. Your conduct. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 Okay. That you will walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So, our identity as salt is when we are we are agents of change and god gets glory when we make a difference not just become different make a difference don't just become different make a difference make a difference in other people's lives make a difference in in where you are your workplace don't just be different make a difference your roommates can see you as different that's not enough how are you changing them? How are you? What is your plan for changing them? Do you have a plan to win them over, or you just want to stay different, so that they they will know that they are going to hell, <laughs> that you are going to heaven, they are going to hell? No. What is your game? What what is what is your plan? Now, okay, God's plan is to release us into the world, so that we can bring change into our sphere. Yeah? And the most effective witness of the gospel is a chain life. Is what? A chain life. The most effective witness of the gospel is a chain life. Paul would just have to come and say, if you don't believe anything, look at me. I was this. How did I change? I received Christ. Because I received Christ, look now I've changed. Is that not Paul that we saw doing all these things? Yes, what I was, I was. But what I am now, you see, the evidence of God's deliverance, trophy of God's salvation, that preaches more, preaches more effectively than saying John 3.16. Yes, that's what the Bible is saying. It says your, your, your conduct preaches, it has a voice. Your conduct has a voice. Just as you have a voice, your conduct, that's why I say people can say, your attitude is, is so loud, I can't hear your good news. Because the way you are snobbish, the way you snob people, and now you are coming to preach to me, you are snobbish. You don't talk to me. You don't mind me. You don't respect me. You insult me. We are all together in this workplace. And we are all seeing what, that you, what the lifestyle you are living is not very different from what we are living. Only that we see you display paraphernalia. Year of good tidings. Year of the ego. Year of enthronement. Then you see the sticker uh, where you are. You see uh, your pastor's picture there. Your church's program, the poster also there. So whenever people are coming to your office, they, they meet your church, they meet your pastor, they meet, they can even meet um, Jesus, <laughs> that, that fake Jesus picture. But, or maybe some logo here, whatever. But, it does not mean that you are preaching to me. Your character is not preaching to me. Okay. So, Salt is most effective when it is dissolved into food. That's why God will send us. God's formula is men. When I say men, I'm talking about mankind, human beings. That is God's formula. 2 Kings 2 verse 19 to 22. Look at a picture, a prophetic picture of what I'm, what I'm saying. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of this city is, is pleasant as my Lord sees. But the water is bad. The water is what? The water is bad. The water is bad. <laughs> the city is nice, but the water is very bad. And the ground barren. Okay. 
And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to, out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, That says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. This is exactly what God does with his people. This is the reason why God sent you to that village. He said, I'm, This village has great potential, but the water is bad. Many young people are there, they don't have direction, they don't have focus. They are going astray because they don't have a shepherd, nobody to direct them. God says, I'm sending you to that village for a natural service. Your first reaction was, God forbid. I will never go to that. That's why, that's why I said in the adult service, pray and ask God, what do you want from my life? What do you want? Where do you want me to be? Somebody was sent to a, 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 a village uh, after Konongo. Then she, she, she's in this ministry. Then she came to me and she said, Ah, oh, daddy, my heart is broken. I want to change it. Then she tried, they, it couldn't change. Then I said, You know what? Go to that village. There are some young girls who will get pregnant if you don't show up. Some young boys who will be addicted to weed smoking, who will live hopeless lives. If you do, so God is sending you to go and preserve a generation. And she was a nurse, so the work that she did, people came to her. Do you know she was able to talk many young girls out of prostitution, fornication, abortion? Then I said, start a fellowship. And she started a girls' fellowship at that place. Unfortunately, unfortunately, she traveled outside the country unfortunately but i pray i know god will raise somebody else to continue the good work she started in that village and who shall i send <laughs> god is saying who shall i send somebody say here am i send him lord here am i send this one Sabronum, who will go? Who will go to Sabronum for me? God says. <laughs> so you see that wherever you find yourself, you see, as a believer, you are like Elisha's salt in a bowl. That God will release you to the stream to heal the waters. Unless you are dissolved into the stream, the waters cannot be healed. That's why we don't stay outside of society and live in monasteries or on mountains or in caves because we don't want them to uh, influence us. No, that's not the plan. God will want us to go. He said you are the salt of the earth. Which means you must be dissolved. That's why he places you into positions. I will show you why God made you a class captain. Class rep. Hall president. Uh, what else? Faculty president. Hey, as a believer, you must begin to see those things as strategic platforms that God has given you for you to effect change. Either as salt or as light. Not just positions to be enjoyed. <laughs> yes. Now, there are three types of relationships we can sustain with the world around us. Now, these three, only one is good. The first one is association. Association is forbidden for the believer. If you want to change the world around you, you should not be like them. You can never change them by being like them. In other words, the bad things they are doing, you cannot say, I want to join them so that I can through that change them. No. That's not God's formula. 
association is forbidden in scripture association means that you are you are you are yoked together with them in other words in other words you do the things they do with them you laugh at the same jokes they laugh at you you delight in the bad things they do there's no difference it says what fellowship what concord has light with darkness or with belial has belial with christ bible says evil communication corrupts good character so association is not for the believer hello it will neutralize your power and weaken your witness. What is in John 2.15? I wrote John 2.15. What is there? Association will weaken your witness. Weaken your witness. Okay. Now, it is dangerous to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because you are not the same. You see, when we say unequal yoke, when they used to use, they used animals for plowing, they would take two, let's say, cows that are of the same height and sometimes the same strength, and they would put the yoke on their necks. And as the two go, go, go forward, they attach the plow to the yoke, and the, the, the ground is plowed. Now, if you take a horse and a cow, we call it an unequal yoke. They cannot be yoked together. It will be lost sight. They are not of the same height. Not of the same strength. So when he says, do not be unequally yoked together of unbelievers, he's trying to say that you, your nature and their nature, they are different. You can never, you can never associate with them to the core and not be influenced. You, and you can't change the world by being like the world. Goliath had a coat of mail. And Saul gave the same coat of meal to David. Go and fight Goliath. And David said, no, I can't walk in this. Why? Because Saul's armor was the, was the same armor Goliath had. And God said, I'm not going to use this. I will use a shepherd's bag and a shepherd's attire to bring down the giant. You have to be different. You have, you have, to, be, you have to dare to be different. Otherwise, you can't make a difference. Don't be afraid to be alone. Don't be afraid to stand alone. Otherwise, you can't, you can't win anybody for Christ. There are certain principles and convictions you never compromise. In the bid to win people, never let down your principles. Stand where you are. Stretch your hand towards them. Do them good. Pray for them. Speak the word to them. Be different and witness. Oh, Paul said, I make myself... All things to all men, then by all means win some. Hey, stop right there. Somebody is quoting that scripture in his mind. What about what Paul said? That I make myself all things to all men, then by all means win them. No, he was talking in context to the Jews, to those who are under the law, and those who are not under the law. He said, when Paul comes to you, let's say uh, this group, and he gauges your strength, that you can, you can only pray for one hour, Paul will not stretch you beyond one hour. He will also decide to pray one hour. After all, it's also prayer. Just to help you. Just to win you. Just to encourage you. Paul will not come and say, no, we are praying 10 hours. If you don't come pray one hour, just get out. To discourage you. So, to the weak, he makes himself weak. To the strong, strong. So that he will by all means win some. To the Jews, Paul can get to a place where he would... They, they, People have taken a vow. He will pay for their vows. And then he will, he will shave himself like a Nazarite. Because most, they believe in Moses' law. And by doing that, they accepted him. Then he preached the gospel to them. So it's not like going to do the bad things with the unbelievers so that you can win them. We don't have to be worldly to win the world. We have to be different. The second relationship we can sustain with the world is isolation. Isolation too is not good. So, association is not good. Isolation too is not good. We should not say, we can't mingle with them. Oh, we can't work with them. We can't be in the same market with them. We can't be in the same school with them. We can't be in the same room with them. Let's separate ourselves. Otherwise, they, they will corrupt us. No. 
corrupt they corrupting you is you opening your ear to hear what they, what they have to say and being influenced it's evil communication because you can't you can't say you will not you will not go to the same room with an unbeliever or even somebody of a different different religion you may find yourself in the same room with a person you may find yourself at the same workplace the work kind of work you do you may find yourself dealing with people of all kinds yes you cannot say let me stay away then it means you have to get out of this world because everywhere you go you meet people you interact with people they are not all born again not all men have faith some are evil some are some are some are just misguided some are good he says, don't isolate yourself. Salt cannot isolate itself and make impact. So God is not saying, isolate yourself from them. So that we say, oh, these ones are going to hell. And we are the ones who are going to heaven. And these are the hell-bound people. Look at the way they have dressed. Look at their hairstyle. Look at their piercings. Look at that. Oh, I can't, I can't even shake them. You mean, you mean this guy is gay and I'm working with a guy in the same work? Oh, I've resigned. You don't know who you are as a believer. Because that workplace, that, that, that guy that you, you, you are afraid of, eh, he, 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 he's your assignment. That's why God sent you there. You see, when you become salt and you become established, your absolutes, your beliefs, and your convictions, they are entrenched. Nobody can convince you. You rather impact on people. Nobody can change you. You'll be standing firm and you'll be changing people. You will love them to change them. By the time they realize they have come to like you, then you are changing them. You are correcting them. Use every influence you have to change somebody's mind from evil to good. Even if you just become born again, that's a step. Another person come and continue. Any influence you have There are people, you see, for instance, there was one man who is a very important person in this country now, very important person. And the man was addicted to smoking. And anytime he would come to a house, he was smoking in chains. The one day my mother called him aside and said, talk to him. He said, you know what? Nobody has been bold to tell me that this thing that I'm doing is not good. He said, I promise you, I will not do it again. That's how he stopped smoking. There was one man who was a drunkard, who get drunk and sleep in gutters. We were in the same neighborhood, the same house. One day, he was sober. My mother called him and said, do you know that as you go out right now, he was going out, as you go out right now, you can just die. Just like that, just die. And then she preached the gospel to him. Just those words. The man followed us to church. The man was a Christian evangelist, sponsored uh, the kingdom till he died. Some you you may think that oh, this is this is I can I can. You can approach somebody. Once the person comes within your sphere, somebody may be looking up to you, a young person. He respects you. He sees you as a mentor. What, I, what, what an opportunity to shape a mind, to influence a mind. An opportunity. They are around you and they call you Bra, uh, Bra Derek, Sister Davida. And they look up to you because you have been to school. And because you dress well. And because you speak good English. Or because you, you do this. How are you using that influence? These are gifts that God gives us. So the next relationship that we must sustain, which is the best of the three, is insulation. 
That's what I just described. Insulation is in John 17, verse 15 to 16. Insulation. It says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. 16 and 17. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Satisfy them by your truth. Your word is truth. So he says, keep them in the world, but they are not of the world. You are in the world, but not of the world. We are doing the same business with them, the same course with them, but we are dancing to a different beat. Our orders come from a different place. Our convictions emanate from a different place. Though we are doing the same thing. We are all footballers, but my convictions are different. We are all businessmen, but my convictions, I don't, I don't compromise. I don't bow to your God, but I will love you. I will speak nicely to you. I will be kind to you. I will not shun you. When you have problems, I will help you. When you are sick, I will lay hands. When you are confused, I will give you counsel. I will advise you, but I will never worship your God. You can never change me to worship your God. I had friends when I was in Cornwall for, I had Rastafarians, people of other religions and all that, who liked me, voted massively for me to become whole president. And the only reason was that I was a nice person. I never preached to them before I was a nice person. Anyone who got close to me, as he was getting close, I was releasing something. I was, I was engaging them in conversation. That's how come I know a lot about other religions. I will talk, talk with them and, find, and, and, and ask them questions. So what do you think about life after death? When a person dies, where do you think he goes? And it's like we are having a, a lovely conversation, but I'm passing the gospel through to you. Just that they were also very entrenched in what they believed. So they will realize that they can't change you. You will try to change them. Are you getting me? Insulation is when you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are in the world, but the world is not in you. The sea is salty, but the fish is not salty. So the salt of the sea does not get into the fish. That's insulation. So we are not supposed to isolate ourselves and shine them and say they are going to hell. That's, 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 that's why believers lost many things. Many of the mountains we lost were because we were practicing isolation. Anything that was technological that came, believers' first reaction was, it's the devil. It's worldly. When television came, believers said, oh, it's called the one-eyed demon. It's devilish. Now, those people still people have television stations. By the time we realized, to get on satellite was very costly, very expensive. But the thing was just at, under our nose. We rejected it. When anything came, social media came, believers are saying, oh, let's reject it. I don't, I don't go to Facebook. I don't go, why? I'm spiritual. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to mingle. Who told you you cannot be on Facebook and be sharing godly content? It depends on what you do there. It's, it's a space. It's a space. You can also go and be sharing what you think it brings life. People are bold to display death and you are shy of displaying your life. What do you do on Facebook? What do you put there? That's what matters. Do you put words that will inspire, will edify, or you just take pictures, take your, your backside, <laughs> then you put it on Facebook. Then you come and tell me, Facebook, it is you that is contributing to the evil on Facebook. We will do that. Then by the time we realize, we will see that we are losing a generation. Because this generation, that's where they are. Social media is a whole country, now you know what I'm telling you. It's a whole country. It's a whole country. Now, if you are a church and you say, you think that you are the only one, you are a pastor, 
If I think I'm the only one pastoring you, I'll be lying. Because influence goes beyond the four walls of this building. I spend few hours with you every week. Social media bombards you with many things. All sorts of ideas. So if you are somebody who goes for window shopping, spiritual window shopping, you become a bundle of contradictions. You become confused. So that's why I give you the chance to ask me questions. Ask me the question you don't understand. I don't know where else you, you went to listen to the gospel. Are you getting me? And I, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to say, go, don't go and listen to this. No, because there are other good things that you can also learn from outside. But the way I make sure you learn the right things, come and ask me what you don't understand. And I will take time and take the Bible and explain to you. So, let us not be quick to condemn things and isolate ourselves. There are many fields that believers shun because the world, and now the world has dominated. Look at the arts. Look at the movie industry. Look at the music industry. Look at the world of sports. Many believers shun those places. Instead of becoming agents of change, saying that I will go there and I will infect that space with what I have. He said, no, 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 no. This is for the unbelievers. Thank God that now things are changing. Now things are changing. Now believers are be becoming smarter. Because the world is wiser in their generation than the children of light. Jesus Christ said it. It's always true. They are streetwise. They know how to take advantage of systems. They are game players. But we are only always concerned about we are going to heaven. And concerned about we are, we are so careful not to miss heaven that we end up not making any difference in our space. You cannot just be praying on the mountain every day and stay there forever. But how much you calm down? Because the real work is down. When they were on the mountain top, and Peter said, Master, it is good that we stay here. I, a father was waiting with a, a sick child beneath the mountain. When they went from the mountain to the, 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 the down, the disciples were struggling with a, 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 a child, trying to cast out a demon from the child. So if Jesus had stayed on the mountain top, that child would have suffered. We don't stay on mountain tops. We receive energy. We receive instruction. We receive strength. And we go out there and make a difference. We come to church to be filled. We don't come to church to glorify God. Change that perception. We come to be filled with his glory. We go out there to glorify him. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and that they may glorify your father who is in heaven. That's how we glorify God. It's not in church. When you come to church, what do you do to God? He fills you with ideas, with knowledge, with wisdom. You go out there. Then you, you provide one solution to somebody. And the person is wild. You lay hands on somebody. The person gets healed. And you tell the person, the kingdom of God has come. You solve a problem, hang up problem. I tell the person, I have more where I came from. Follow me to church. Let, let's go and encounter this God I've encountered. You see, I have so much peace. You know where that peace comes from? Let me show you. Come, follow me. Why are you always peaceful? Why is it that we all went through this situation, but you came back stronger? You came back better. He said, oh, you want to know? Come, follow me. Let me introduce you to my God. I have a secret. One day, some people were in a discussion. And then, my father was a subject those days. And then one of them was a believer. Then they asked among themselves, what is he using? Then that person said, do you know what he's using? I know what he's using. He said, what? His name is Jesus. Jesus. He said, what? Jesus. Don't tell anybody. It's Jesus. <laughs> there are people should ask, what are you using? Because 
We see the problems around you and yet you are focused. You are calm. What happened to me happened to you but you stood firm. I gave up but you stood firm. What's your secret? Why do you have such stamina? Endurance? Resilience? Then you say, it's not of him that ran it. Not of him that will it. But of God that showed mercy. Let me introduce you to my God. What a way to witness. Somebody wrote a letter to me in this form, after this form. Then he said, I noticed that you are so peaceful. He said, I can't help to be sorrowful and bitter. What is your, what is your secret? Then I said, my secret is the Lord. He said, my secret is the Lord. Then he said, I'm also a believer. I said, yes. Maybe you have not brought your mind to it. You have to enter into a personal relationship. That same person, many years later, recently, his child was going to the university. And he sent me a message. He said, can you tell me how I will be able to help this boy not to depart from Christian principles? And I gave him four, four steps, four, four, four tips. You see. Now, let me end with light of the world. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That deals with the charisma, the power, pomp, and pageantry of the kingdom. Luke 2, 9, glory shines. When you see glory, it shines. Luke 2, 9, glory shines. And it strikes fear. And inspires all in people. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. The glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. So glory shines. Are you getting it? Okay. So the light shines to attract attention. The aim is to register the glory of God in the minds of people. In a layman's language, it is to spread his fame. To spread his fame. To spread his fame. So there's an aspect of the church's responsibility to ensure that Jesus, the name Jesus, is lifted high. The banner of Christ lifted high. That we spread his fame and his name. And that one is the light of the world aspect of the church. And there are some people that God, that God has put them in strategic positions. This is what they should be doing. They should be lifting up the torch of, uh, of, of, of the gospel. Okay? In terms of pushing for policies, changing policies, affecting the framework, social framework, affecting the political landscape, landscape influencing decisions and all that. Then the rest of the church, we also go underground. We are also changing assault. This one, they are giving the light. Not all believers will be placed in prominent positions. So when God places you in such position, know that it's not by mistake. You are part of those who are supposed to champion the cause of the gospel by lifting the torch. Don't let God down. The light, the church as the light of the world, enhances the image of Christ. Through the things we do. And we change people by our identity as salt. Okay? So, this, when you look at a tree, a tree has leaves. What does the leaf do? The leaf, what the leaves do in the tree is that the leaves, they attract attention. They are just always shaking. But the leaves don't feed people. It's fruits that feed people. One day, Jesus got up in the morning and he was hungry. And then he saw a fig tree with a lot of leaves and then he went closer that maybe he would get fruit. Then he didn't get any fruit, only leaves. And he cursed the fig tree. Not because he was hungry, but because the fig tree had been deceiving man for a long time. He was the same person who deceived Adam and Eve. They tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. And Jesus Christ said, you, from now, no man will ever eat fruit from you again. In other words, that's the end of religion. Now I've come to give life. But the point I'm trying to make is that the fruit was what was looking for, not the seed. It didn't say be seedful, it said be fruitful. Do you know what people look for when they come to church? It's not activities. It's not the, sharp, the jumping and shouting. They're looking for love. People come to church beaten by the world, 
looking for a place of solace and refuge, fruit, love. So when you drive people away from church by your reckless statements, by your reckless attitude, and then you come and sh jump and shout and grab, and all you have missed the whole point. You have missed the whole point altogether. People are coming for fruit, not leaves. Let's make sure we have fruit for people to eat. Beyond the leaves, we used to attract them. The nice, nice things we say, the, 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 char the charisma. Now, that one attracts. But when they come close, can they get fruit? Can they get fruit? God wants the world to see certain things. He wants the world to see. Let your light so shine that they may see. He's, what, there's anything he wants the world to see. Yes. Jesus Christ said that the world may know that I love the Father. John 14, right there, John 14, 30, 31. That the world may know that I love the Father. John 17, 23. That the world may know that you have sent me. Matthew 5, 16. That the world may see your good works and glorify God. You see, the gospel is preached by the church to the principalities and powers when the manifold wisdom of God is displayed. Ephesians 3 verse 10. Let, let's read that one. Ephesians 3 verse 10. Look at how the church is to preach the gospel. Not only to people, but also to the principalities and powers to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities that's how we preach that we, 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 we become the light of the world as a church, the body of Christ. I've shown you how we become light as an individual. Now, as a body, we become light when we enhance the image of Christ. That's why the gospel of the kingdom, whenever it's preached, you see power. You see power. Do you know? One aspect of God's wisdom that the church must display to the world. Supernatural power. Supernatural power. Why is it that when COVID-19 came, the church was not listed among essential services? The banks, the hospitals, pharmacies, they said they were essential services. Is that also? Was the church in the list? No. Why? Because we are not solving any problems. Because they don't see, they don't, they don't see that we are essential to life. Because the church should have been the first place the government will consult. Men and brethren, what shall we do? In the early days, kings consulted prophets. Say, what is God's mind? What shall we do? There are some leaders of nations. They still consult the church to find God's mind. Before America invaded Iraq, Operation Desert Storm, Billy Graham was invited to the White House by George Bush. Bob Jones, CIA, had his line, direct line. When Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, was hiding, Bush consulted some men of God. And you think it was just military operation that figured him out. No. I'm talking about that level where the church cannot cannot be taken for granted. Where the church becomes a force to reckon with. Because they will see that we are essential to life. COVID was a test case. Ghana here. You saw it. Because they, they see that all that we do is organize camp meetings and conventions. And all that we do is organize prayer meetings and go, go and present our needs before God and celebrate and jump about the things they have in, in, in abundance. Why would they not take us out of that list of service? Because when they look at us, the things that we are excited about the cars, traveling, the houses, the money. They have those things in abundance. What at all is attracting the world to the church? It should be power. That is what they don't have. 
that when we can speak and say we are we are praying this thing will not come to ghana and it will jump over ghana and it's public people here we are, we are enhancing the image of christ the church will become important when we can speak we, we can become one and we can have a voice and speak to power and things happen people will bow in the bible the proconsul by jesus was trying to dissuade him paul said now you child of satan you will be blind and the guy got blind and the leader the proconsul believed the gospel their lawyers are loose when they see the power of god it's not about our lectures it's not about our seminars world christian seminars that's not what we are trying the world to ask the world you see the world can just come to us and just pat us on the back and say you are doing well pastor you are doing well. the things you are preaching even unbelievers they are making knows it will never change them they will pat you the, the things you are preaching in church they can get it at gimpa they can get a better version at gimpa they can get a better version in a in a in a seminar so what are you talking about that's when the world comes to applaud us and say oh then we are doing well no the world should bow it, they should bow at the feet of the church he said gentiles will come to your light and their kings they will come to the brightness of your rising they will come and bow he said a day will come that the mountain of the lost house shall be exalted above all mountains and all the nations shall flow to it you see we have pictures i can show you in the body of christ but i'm talking about where the church as an entity as a as a as a body enters into that identity because when you go to nigeria right now and go to kenya land right now they have been there for 25 years no power outage no power outage in nigeria where people i mean you know nepa nepa is the one that is it's like our acg yes every three hours the lights will go off the oil rich country they, you have to buy a generator and so they even say nepa is never expect power always and in the midst of that that chaos a church has been able to pro provide power uninterrupted for 25 years that is the light of the world the world will see that and respect the church now when they see that the church is getting money they tremble they panic do you know why because that is also one way to preach the gospel he said because of you they went out preaching the gospel and they didn't ask anything from the gentiles the church wants the world wants us to come cup in hand begging can we get your coins to go to, to sponsor our crusades go to the world to beg for coins to sponsor our crusade and, and later they will ridicule us god forbid that's why we must allow ourselves for god to raise us up to sponsor the work because the world will never release money and they will laugh at you also but can't your god sponsor your crusade why are you coming to us you said we are going to hell why are you coming to us <laughs> Anything that enhances the image of Christ in society is light. And we should thank God for that. And we should pray that we have more light like that. There are people that God has put them in positions of influence. What God is saying is that lift up the banner of Christ high for all to see. You are a watchman in the public space. William Wilberforce was a businessman and a parliamentarian. And he was influential in the abolition of slave trade in England. And the, the spillover effect in Africa. He was a Christian. But he, he was not just different. He became a voice. Why? He had power. He had leverage. He used the power he had to make a change sam george is a christian parliamentarian who is using his voice to make a change and we need to pray for him and applaud him for that because he's a, he's a believer 
Look at now the, the, the bill that they have passed now. Now waiting for president to give his assent. We are watching. Whether he will do it before December 7th or not. We are, we, are, we are all watching. But Sam George, who dead now, do you know that now they have blacklisted him? He can't travel to certain countries because of his stand against LGBT. Yes. He took that risk for the church. It doesn't matter. He, he's a believer and he's, he's using his voice, the power he has, leverage he has to fight so that the name of Christ will be lifted high. So that Christ will be registered in the public space. There are many believers who are also in parliament. They will vote against, they, they, will, they can vote against this bill. Yeah, I don't want to be seen as that. So they will vote again. There are many people, God puts them there. They have become salt that has lost its flavor. And so they are good for nothing. They are just occupying positions, just, just, just getting money. They are not making any changes. Where you are working, the, the reason why God puts you there, God wants you to be an agent of change. Let that stick into your mind. I, I, I told you of the, the, the lady who turned many people, many young girls away from abortion because she was there. What leverage do you have? How are you using it to the kingdom's advantage? There are people who can even rise to become, rise to positions of influence and they will even join the world to fight the church in the name of so-called enlightenment. That all these people, somebody can rise up, a believer, and can bring, a, 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 and can support a law. Let's ban prayer at Paju. They are, they are there praying, praying. Let's, let's stop them. Are you, are you here to learn or to pray? A believer will be sitting there, joining them. Oh, yes, yes they are yes, young people. They are not, they are just, it, it's just zeal, just zeal, just zeal. Meanwhile, God was cooking a revival through those pockets of prayer meetings happening at Pajo. Tuesdays, you pass there, you see people praying, praying. What harm will it do to the university? That's why now Boko Haram is trying to infiltrate unless god has left us a remnant would have been like sodom without knowing because believers who find themselves at places they think that it was their own making they think because they they they, they, they studied and they got their positions and all that do you know why god has given you something that the average believer not every believer has it whether it's money whether it's uh, influence whether it's power even political power those who want to go to politics, let this be your mind. You are going there to be like what Sam George is doing. Anything that will fight the church, you fight it. Then God will say, yes, I have a man in parliament. I have a woman in the, in the Jubilee house. I have a man in the judiciary. If all about this one will stand for my name. Okay. Yes. So what banner are you raising? You see, the Catholic Bishop Conference, I've watched them. Anytime something evil is cropping up, they'll come out and speak. Catholic Bishop Conference, they condemn things that the government is doing that will be, that will be inimical to the church and society. When President Obama brought these two people that were in the Guantanamo Bay, they, they were released. The Catholic bishops stood against it and said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> At the point they said, the uh, president said, we have, to, we have to be kind. Then they said, kindness without common sense, there's no kindness. But the charismatists may go help us. Because we think that the Catholics and all the people, they are canal. Because they indulge in all these things. Had it not been for them, eh, the light of the church would have, been, would, have, would, have, would, have, would have gone up. It is these same Catholics. When you go to Israel, they are the ones who have preserved the history of Christ. Do you know Israel doesn't respect Christ? Less than 2% are Christians. It's the Catholics who have preserved these sites. Sycamore tree. Uh, even though there are some myths and all that. But at least... They preserve all those things. At least, 
not if of anything, at least the story. You go there, you see the original site. They have been preserved. It's the church, the Catholic church that did all those things. That's why, yes. But the charismatics, we are good at what we, we, we are good at. We'll blow the tongues all right. We'll do all the gimmicks. But you see that even the church itself, we are not changing. We are, we are not changing. We, we pray in tongues, we do all those things, but our lives are not changing. There's something that is, that is missing. Hallelujah. Let's be on our feet. And let's pray. As a believer, don't just sit down for others to push their opinions on you. No. Use every leverage of influence, authority, and power to spread the light and push darkness away. When we, when we say, I am the head, not the tail. What, you know what that means? The head is what decides. And the tail follows on. So if you are the head, not the tail, among your friends, don't allow them to influence you. Influence them. When, 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 when you, you, are, you are shy to show that you are a believer, you are shy to say you are a Christian, there's something wrong with you. That you hide your identity because of your friends. Because they will say, hey, so you two, you believe all these, all these things. So if you are part of those Christian people, then you are shy to say, yes, I'm a believer. I'm proud of it. I have life. I'm not ashamed. People have death and they are proud of death. You have life and you are ashamed of life. What a contrast. <laughs> Don't be ashamed of your of, of, of life you have. You have life. Be proud of it. Show it. Display it. Let them know. I'm a believer. Let them know. I, this is what I stand for. I'm a Christian. This is what I stand for. You can never change my mind, so don't, don't, don't bother. You can never change my mind. This, this, don't bother. Don't, don't, don't even bring it up. You can't change my mind. I am so resolute and entrenched in my absolutes, my beliefs, and my convictions. I'm here to change you. Not you to change me. Sometimes we, we, we are shy. I don't know. We are shy. We, we shy away from even the church. For, for you to be doing evangelism, witnessing, telling people about Christ, ah, I don't want them to know I'm part of them. It means there's something seriously wrong. Who, who, will, who will hide life? Eh? Who will be shy of life? We are praying that make me like a tree planted by the rivers of water so that I bear fruit in due season. Let's pray. Kalamaha Sandele Beketes Le Kro Malaya Talama Kambalas Le Kambali Alabaha Zili Bahas Reketo Bahali Adabasidas. Help us, Lord, to be planted. To be planted by rivers of water that will bear fruit in due season. That will bear fruit in due season. People are looking for fruit, not leaves. People are looking for fruit. People are looking for kindness, looking for love, looking for peace, joy, patience. A word, a word that is seasoned with salt from your lips as a believer. A word that will come out of your mouth and calm people down and calm troubled situations down a word of wisdom that will bring solution that will edify people people come to you they are attracted by your charisma and they are looking for fruit not leaves leaves will attract them we need to pray as a church let us not invest in leaves let's labor to produce fruit it is fruit that will satisfy people it is fruit that will help people not leaves we should not lose our leaves but we should not mistake, we should not replace fruit with leaves. Shalamakaba. Lebraha talabako sele. Second prayer. May my leaves never wither. May it be ever green and fresh. May I never lose my zeal, my love for you, my passion, my charisma. May I never lose it. But may I never replace it, replace fruit with it. 
but may I also never lose my zeal. May I be joyful always in the Lord. May I, may I be proud of life. May I be proud of the life I have, the life I have. May, may I be happy, happy, happy to be a Christian, happy to be an agent of change, happy to be the salt of the earth. May I use any power I have, any opportunity I have, any platform I have to make Jesus popular, to spread his fame, to spread his name, any platform to spread his name. What are you doing on your platforms, on your social media platforms that are secular, that is not church? What are you doing? How do they know you? How do you spread the, the name of Christ? What are the scriptures you are, you are using to shape minds? What what are the the, the responses? Shalaba komas, redeke paha, malekre behana stetes, nunkati pahala, lekro matasitele, lokamba diada salaba. Oh, help us, Lord! Help us, Lord, as salt and light. Help us, Lord, to be effective as salt. To be effective as salt. To be effective as salt. Silent but powerful. And also to be as light, a voice shining in the darkness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are praying for Ghana. May the banner of Christ be exalted above every other banner in Ghana. Let's pray. May the banner of Christ be exalted above every other banner on this land in the name of jesus shalema kapa rendete bradoko shentete mente pelebete reke pere masutes kim pratapa le krapatapa mande predoko shutim menko para bakada rebeke do sendebele mende peleke doa akapara yade selembra hando radeko pari atendes in no sitata let the banner of christ be exalted above every other banner in this nation in the name of jesus let the banner of christ be exalted above every other banner in this nation every nook and cranny of this nation let the banner of christ be exalted in the name of jesus people that god has placed in strategic positions let them come and take up the torch and wave it wide let them take up the torch let christ be known let christ be seen let christ be heard in the name of jesus in this nation let the church rise up as one man and then the church begin to register her voice her voice in our face of this nation and society in the name of jesus let the world be the path to the door of the church for solution for wisdom for healing for deliverance for protection for preservation for immunity let them come and ask us what is your secret help us lord thank you lord we give you praise father we thank you we give you praise thank you for your word help us to be effective as salt and as light wherever you have placed us for we know it is by orchestration that we find ourselves in certain places at certain places in certain positions in certain environments help us lord to be agents of change to push darkness away to spread light in jesus name amen hallelujah let's be seated for a while um we are taking our offering today is the first sunday of the month and every first sunday of the month we take mission offering and then the main offering to support the, our crusades and mission activities so we are which one are we taking first we are taking the main offering now okay If you want a tight bag, you can also. No. Okay.
When I think upon your goodness And your faithfulness each day I'm convinced it's not because I am worthy to receive that kind of love that you give but I'm grateful for your mercy and I'm grateful for your grace and because of how you poured out yourself to sing this song out in praise. Amen, Lord. Amen, Lord. Oh, Kaka. Oh, Nyeke. My Lord, who am I to sing your praises? Who am I to worship you, Lord? Who am I to worship you? It's your blood that makes a difference in me and made a way. I could never sing your song.
Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the place you have given me before the throne of grace, even to come to your table to dine with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price you paid for me. I present these emblems, the bread and the wine, which represents your flesh and your blood, respectively. As I eat his body and drink your blood, I declare that I'm connected to the Lord Jesus by life. I declare that the Zoe life of God dwells in me. I declare that the incorruptible seed of God abides in me. I declare that the DNA of God is in my system. For I am a part of his body according to 1 Corinthians 6.15 and one spirit with him according to 1 Corinthians 6.17. I therefore place a demand on the Zoe life of God in me. Let the life in my spirit man swallow and devour any seed of death in my body, my blood, my bones, and my whole being. Let the record of the life in God's DNA in my spirit be released to affect my mind and my body in the name of Jesus. Let my body relax and succumb to the Zoe life in my spirit in the name of Jesus. Therefore, let every infirmity in my body bow out. Let every pain in my body leave. Let every poison in my body be neutralized in the name of Jesus. Let every curse in my system be broken and reversed. I serve the Lord and therefore my food and water are blessed. And sickness is not permitted to have its way in my body. According to Exodus 23-25. I tap into the ever-flowing fountain of the blood of Jesus. I say amen to the speakings of the blood. I raise the blood of Jesus as a canopy over and above me and my family in the name of Jesus. Finally, I partake of this communion with my spiritual family with the understanding that I am just a part of the body and I can't make it alone. I need other believers as much as they need me. I will gladly serve the body with my grace allotment even as I receive from the grace allotment of others. I I take this communion designing the Lord's body and recognizing that I belong to the body and I submit to the body in Jesus' name. I am not a spiritual orphan. I am not a spiritual vagabond. I am connected, covered, and planted. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the communion. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege you have given us. We are so grateful. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah. What are we saying to daddy? Daddy, God bless you. You're all welcome to Touch World Ministries International. We are a family. We are the house of Judah, Joseph, and Asha. That is dominion, fruitfulness, and the word. We are a missionary church family, and we reach, disciple, equip, and release. Hallelujah. Please, is there anyone? Else?